creating a legendary partnership from bootstrapping to butt kicking and how Ryan O'Donovan and Colby Barr are designing the new category of California artisan coffee. All right, all right, all right. Hey ho, let's go. Welcome to Legends and Losers, where we aspire to have authentic dialogues about what it takes to design a legendary business and a legendary life. And man, am I ever glad you're joining us. If you're a new listener, welcome. And if you've been with us for a while, my apologies. <laughs> uh, today, we have two of my absolute favorite entrepreneurs, uh, Colby Barr and Ryan O'Donovan from Verve Coffee. And Verve is one of the most exciting new companies to emerge on the West Coast in this uh, new co category of artisan coffee that's happened in California and frankly on the West Coast of the uh, excited states. And they are started and headquartered here in the beautiful uh, ocean town of Santa Cruz, California. And uh, I'll give you a little bit more on them in a second. A couple things off the top. Uh, number one, I want to thank you very much for sharing episode 62 with Judge Kelvin Filer, sitting uh, Superior Court Judge in Los Angeles um, uh, out of Compton, California. And um, this episode and dialogue with Judge Filer is uh, lighting the world up. If you want to be inspired, you want to feel better about being a human being, and um, you want to be inspired on your own legendary path, check out episode 62, 62 with Judge Kelvin Filer. Uh, all right. Also want to let you know that I am on tour with my friends at NetSuite. Um, and on September 20th, we'll be in the beautiful uh, mountain town of Denver. September 26th in beautiful Toronto, Canada, eh? September 27th, New York and November 9th in Miami. And so I'd love it if you'd come out and spend some time with us. I'll be with Jason Maynard and uh, a group of other thought leaders. We'll be talking about what it takes to design a legendary business today, the use of technology and creating unfair competitive advantage and how you can be next ready. To request your invitation to the Next Ready Business Tour and to come out and see me and Jason and the rest of the team, any of those dates, send email to blackhole at legends and losers.com and we will get you set up all right colby Barr and ryan o'donovan uh, i met these guys uh in santa cruz as a customer um they opened up their first um cafe in a kind of right on the border of santa cruz and capitola and uh, when they did it transformed the neighborhood as a matter of fact a lot of people in the neighborhood said wow this 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 place looks like it should be in you know uh, Soho, New York, or somewhere else. <laughs> it was quote unquote too nice for Santa Cruz. And um, uh, that was approximately 10 years ago. In that time, uh, Ryan and Colby have gone on to build what most people consider to be the company, the uh, coffee firm that is pioneering this new category of California artisan coffee. You are about to hear about their amazing relationship and the twists and turns that it took to get them to being the coffee uh, gurus that they are today, and ultimately what led them to start Verve Coffee Roasters and uh, how they've become so incredibly successful. As a matter of fact, today, they are the de facto standard coffee uh, inside the uh, cafeterias and cafes at Silicon Valley restaurants like Facebook, Airbnb, Amazon, Netflix, LinkedIn, Salesforce, Palo Alto, Intuit, and Lyft, and more. And so um, they've really set the world on fire. They're in Santa Cruz, they're in Los Angeles, they're in, uh, of course, beautiful San Francisco, and they recently opened in Tokyo. And of course, they're always on the World Wide Web at vervecoffee.com. And now, my good friends, Ryan and Colby, are on Legends and Losers. Where, where is or was Ray's Liquor? That would be in Chico. Chico, California. Yeah. But it's not there anymore? It's a good question. Not quite sure. <laughs> but it was legendary in its time. The supplier of many a good college evening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you guys met there, did you? Yeah. Yeah, we met in Chico. Yeah. So tell me about that. Well, we both were musicians, so 
kudos to all of your music memorabilia. <laughs> what what yeah, kind of music do you guys listen to? Uh, different types of music, kind of like soul, funk, and I don't know what you would call it. Like he played, he was in alt country. I played like a rock band, like yeah. desert rock. So we were kind of all over the place. Yeah, desert rock, that's a cool category. That's an amazing category. So what's desert rock? Like Queens of the Stone Age, like Temecula. What's so, the guy, Josh, is it home? Yeah. The head of the Queens of the Stone Age? Yeah, I think home, home, yeah. Home. That guy's a musician. Yeah, he's legit. Yeah. Yeah. His stuff's amazing. All the Queens of the Stone Age stuff and all the early desert session stuff they did was influential on the one of the last bands I played in in Chico before kicking this thing off with Ryan but it was like we just were all channeling inner desert rock just droned out sort of three guitars layered thick few chord were you changes. playing guitar or keyboards well, I played keyboards that's how Ryan and I met but in, in then that band I was like also playing guitar which I was just learning to do so it was pretty <laughs> All you need are three chords. Yeah. Right? D, A, G, probably E, maybe four chords, and then you're good to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, you can, you can get a long ways with that. And that guy, Josh, was in um, this amazing band that I think has only had one record with Dave Grohl on drums. And, oh, shit, I'm going to embarrass myself. The bass player, John, who's the bass player from Led Zeppelin? John Paul, John Paul Jones. Jones. John Paul Jones, thank you. I was going to say John Etz, Etz with, at, at, at Whistle. He was the bass player originally in The Who. But yeah, John Paul Jones. So John Paul Jones, Josh Holm from um, uh, Queens of Stone Age. Queens of Stone Age. And Dave Roll on drums. The band was called Them Crooked Vultures. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, shit. I forgot about that. That was a cool record. Yeah, it was amazing. Uh, John Paul Jones is like... He's like one of the greatest Hero. heroes of all time that yeah. no one really seems to know about, but he's, he's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Keyboards and also bass, but yeah, we, we Ryan and I though, we played like, I don't even know our cro We went, we played different things, but then our crossover was more like, like playing soul. Uh, like, I don't know. I don't know how you call it without sounding lame. Like, Dance, like music you could sing. No, more like definitely a lot of instru instrumental stuff. More like on the early acid jazz. Yeah, I was right, supposed to like try to figure out how not to say acid jazz. jazz. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what are the like the breakbeat stuff? Yeah, yeah, like breakbeat and like you know we we played vintage instruments, so that was like our thing. So that's why that music made so much sense. Like I was toting around um, full suitcase Fender Rhodes, you know, with clavinets and moogs and all that. Ryan, Ryan had was toting around Hammond organs. Yeah. Um, also, Rhodes and like everyone else was like just on Korg O and W, like modern keyboards. Yeah, yeah, and digital we were, keyboards. Like, the yeah. guys that just like had to just drag heavy pieces of wooden furniture with musical instruments in them. Take around. the whole band to carry. Yeah, and also uh, and a full band, vehicle. If it broke, yeah, it would be, fucked. Yeah, that'd be it. You couldn't play, right? No. And I learned that you can't actually play a Hammond off a generator. True story. Yeah. You know, what, it, what happens? Well, there's a tone, there's something in it, uh, Hammond called a tone wheel that spins at a certain frequency that allows whatever the organ to work. And if you're hooked up on a generator, the frequency is different. And so the whole organ's just out of pitch. And how did you figure out that a Hammond doesn't work on a generator? <laughs> <laughs> something bad must have been going on. Yeah, some really bad sounds. Um, yeah, I dragged it up to a trippy festival out in the middle of nowhere and in the woods outside of Chico and plugged it in and during sound check we're like what the fuck is going on with the guy on the keyboards yeah so what did you end up doing just played I had a world or electric piano just played that yeah so I guess you always have a backup of yeah the more modern shit that works right? mm -hmm. well yeah. not that modern but yeah or I said more modern yeah <laughs> <laughs> And so were you, did you guys like have a band together or did you just geek out on keyboards? Yeah, we didn't have a band together because we were the only keyboardists, really. Um, am I echoing? No, you're perfect. Okay, cool. And yeah, how do we, how do we just, I think it was just through the community and through, um, yeah. well, and at, at Cine Cortez. Yeah, from the music point, we were just like 
those two guys that like there were some other people before and after us that were those guys also but there was a point in time where it was like just ryan and i so if you needed like that sound the vintage sound of fender roads and electric pianos and the real shit you just would like call ryan or i um and so we kind of knew each other about that way like kind of like respect from a distance like okay cool but and we had mutual friends um like casey stuff like Mm -hmm. that but um and i kind of knew bryn but yeah um yeah so that's kind of how 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 we like knew of each other and then through it was actually through coffee that we ended up kind of connecting like one-to-one so did you say like hey let's go get a coffee and talk (laughs) keyboards (laughs) No, that sounds like something a keyboard player would say. <laughs> so good guess. <laughs> no, how did it work? Well, we I left Chico, um, and you stayed. Mm-hmm. And there was no co- no real coffee connection other than, you know, we saw each other. I worked in coffee bars in Chico. And, was this after you graduated? Uh, yeah. Sort of graduated? Ish, yeah. Technically, no. So after you the, didn't after, graduate college, Ryan? After the era that one would have graduated. So you don't have a degree? I, nope. No, nope. I do not. Do you, Colby? I'm curious. Is my mom listening? Yeah. <laughs> hey, mom. It's just no. the three of us who were having beers. Yeah, I, I'm. I, I was uh, three classes short. But I finished my entire. In my defense, this is for the mom, my mom out there. Hey, mom. Uh, I finished my degree, everything, all advanced courses, my master's thesis, everything's done. I just needed to take three general ed classes <laughs> and you didn't do it including like Spanish one. And I just was like, I have to stick around for a whole nother semester to take three classes that I don't need to take. And I just said, fuck it. And I just went on and started working. <laughs> and you don't either. No. And in the United States, I wouldn't have even gotten a high school diploma Ooh. because I grew up in Quebec, Canada. And the way it works is you do high school to grade 11 and then what here is grade uh, 12 and 13 is this sort of, it's like community college is kind of the vibe of mm-hmm. it. It's called Seja. And you could do a two-year program that sets you up for university, or you could do a three-year program and you can get like a, you know, trades diploma or something like that. Or you could do three years and then go on to college, whatever you want to do. Anyway, so I did one year of that for which I got thrown out. So in the United <laughs> States, I would have gotten thrown out at grade 12. Nice. But technically, I have a, I guess I have a high school diploma, but I, it's not really worth much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, I think I have, you guys both me because I have completed all the courses. I had to put, complete like a few units after graduation. Like I, I walked the ceremony. I was in the... You were there? No, well, sort of. Yeah. I, I was in the brochure. In spirit. Yeah. And so when you guys stopped going to school... Sort of not really with your degrees. You think, okay, now what am I going to do with myself? Yeah. Well, I was already at that point. It was a choice between like, you know, do I stick around and play in bands forever, or do I f- figure some other something else out? So I was already deep down the coffee path, and actually left Chico to go open a coffee shop in Bend where I moved to um, with another friend, not Colby. Did, did you think coffee was going to be a career? It was sort of just my, what I knew and I enjoyed it. And it was kind of my way out of having to go get a real job per se. <laughs> so you thought, hey, I'll make some lattes and figure life out? Yeah, more like, um, yeah, in a way. Yeah, make some lattes and... That'll be the next move and we'll, we'll you know, take it from there type of thing. And did you think you'd become a coffee entrepreneur? Well, I was, I was certainly inspired by some folks in Chico who were, who were that. Um, some small coffee shop owners that opened up a window to me that I was not familiar with in terms of small business ownership. You know, make your own schedule, do whatever you want. Pendarvis. Legend. Do whatever you want. That guy's amazing. What up, Chris? Does he do Every day, all day. Dude, winning. To this day. <laughs> What's his name? His name's Chris Pendarvis. Yeah. He inspired myself, Colby, and, and numerous others. But As a coffee entrepreneur. Particularly as a 
I don't even know. Renegade entrepreneur of all types. Yeah. Yeah. Risk, he was, he was more taker, like, yeah. The whole thing. So I was already kind of down the path of, Hey, I, I kind of, I had a glimpse of what it looks like to, to start a coffee shop and what that lifestyle could be like. And I was also sort of deeply falling into the coffee game by the time I moved out of Chico and to Bend on that path. It, and how do you go from guy who's trying to make a living slinging lattes to I want to own a coffee shop to I want to be the head of a coffee empire, <laughs> <laughs> an evil, an evil coffee empire. Yeah, super evil. So much evil. Well, it snowballed pretty quickly over the course of a couple of years. Um, I went to Bend and then Portland. Definitely got my eyes opened there. Um, worked for a handful of other coffee roasting companies in different capacities and realized that there was more than just coffee that I was interested in. There's really a movement around what became the third wave coffee, what we call third wave coffee. Was so, so what is third wave coffee? I've heard you describe this so many times. I'm going to take a stab at that one. I'll take a stab at it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's a term that was came up I don't in the past 10 years uh, but it's the idea that the first wave of coffee is sort of like your grandfather's coffee world war coffee institutional canned coffee five cent free refills kind of the nostalgia of coffee um the you mean the coffee that really tastes like shit sort of the almost like the gas station or the barber because coffee used to be this you know as a kid Coffee used to be this thing that was free that people gave you in the waiting room yeah. and it tasted like ass and not good ass. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other thing coffee was, was sort of, you know, five cents at, at Dunkin' Donuts or, you know, I grew up in Canada. And so we had all these local uh, donut shops re really popular in Montreal, donuts and, and all throughout Canada, Tim Hortons. Tree. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So, coffee shop donut or coffee shop or donut shop coffee for the love of. And it was terrible. Terrible. And so is that phase one or Yeah. One? Yeah, but basically yeah. that era of just I don't know where Tim Hortons fell at that time, but but um I just know it I know it from as a Canadian company, but uh yeah, you know, Folgers, Uban, Maxwell House, fill it to the brim, you know. My coffee never tastes, you know, it never has a second cup when I make it. Like all those. Good to the last drop. Yeah, all of those, <laughs> that, all of those campaigns, leave it to Beaver Coffee. And second, um, second wave coffee would be what Howard Schultz did, which was the advent of co espresso culture, espresso drink culture, coffee house culture, third place, essentially Starbucks. Was that the coffee industrial revolution? I think that would be more first wave. It was more first yeah. wave. Yeah. 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 What, Second what, wave was more like foofy revolution. Because in the beginning, Starbucks was trying to emulate a more authentic experience than it seems to be today, would you say? More authentic in which way? It was trying to be reminiscent of being in, in Italy or France. Yeah, I think... I mean, you know, the story is that he went to Italy for like a trade show and saw all of the espresso culture that was going on there in the street level cafes and said, and just became enamored with it and thought, you know, this is missing. This is, you know, in your world this category, you know, this is something that's not existing. And he came back, you know, to help convert Starbucks, which was at that point, I think just really doing whole bean sales into this coffee to help embrace this coffee house culture and with it espresso culture. So it was kind of two, two for one. It was coffee house culture, but also espresso drink culture. Um, and he brought that back and, and you know, that, that, that was, that was really important for what led to become the third wave because people getting used to going to coffee shops, liking coffee shop culture and willing to pay more than five cents for a cup of coffee and maybe like, five dollars for a cup of coffee you know he he's been paving that path for like 30 years 20 yeah. years yeah and 
one of the greatest entrepreneurs and category designers of our time, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know he's competition, but you gotta hundred percent. No. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You, As we say today, respect. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, you, yeah. You have to respect Howard. He's, Absolutely. Uh, he's amazing. And so, you know, interestingly, in a world that's dominated by category kings, you guys are two kind of wannabe musicians, which. I understand. I went to a fine arts high school. I was in. I was playing in bars and bands when I was fourteen. Mm -hmm. Nice, you know, record deal, the whole thing. We thought we were going to be it. Yeah. Um, and so you're. I know that place as a young man. You want to be a musician, but you come to this realization as you get a little bit older, like, fuck, this is kind of a dumb way to try to make a living. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you cast around looking for something. But then here you are today in the parlance of our times, legit copy entrepreneurs, and you've defined a niche um, where you can thrive even in the shadow of a giant category king. Mm -hmm. Is that this third wave or what is it that allows you guys to do that? Yeah, I mean, so yeah, jumping to third wave, I'm, you know, third, first wave and second wave are easier for me to describe. Like I can just see it, but maybe third wave because I'm too close to it. It's harder for me to describe, but you know, the symbol of third wave is latte art. Like I'm not saying that's the most important, but <laughs> if I'm trying to sum it up in this easy way, like it, when you think latte art, when you think barista culture um, and sort of this feeling of people having this next tier of expectation for coffee, a lot of the places that were first wavers Ha now serve second wave type coffee. So like even McDonald's stepped up their coffee program to, you know, their, um, to their, you know, serving hundred percent Arabica. Um, you know, my dad says, you know, he's just noticed over the past 10 years that, you know, all the weird little shitty places that he'll drink coffee, he thinks it's getting better. Like the expectations are rising and it's being teed off by what third wave's done, which is sort of like the world we live in of, I don't know, trying to find like the very best coffees, the micro lots, um, yeah, barista culture and sort of this elevated experience the same way that Starbucks elevated it from first wave. And is it akin to what's going on with sort of West Coast beers, the craft beer mm. category and West Coast IPAs? And even more so, there seems to be this mega trend towards companies that feel more authentic. Mm that are, 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 are less, you know, industrial monsters. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, we, uh, going back to Chico, Sierra Nevada is from Chico yeah. and was, is a huge inspiration Legendary for, for job. both of us. You could argue the Sierra Nevada Brewing Company started uh, the craft, uh, craft beer West Coast, movement, yeah. right? Yeah. Is that, do you think that's fair? Totally. I do, yeah. Super fair. Pale Ale created it. Yeah. I mean, even to, I mean, if they're not the category king of Pale Ale, I don't know who is. Because even if, maybe not anymore, but until like not long ago, you could just walk into somewhere and say, I'll have a Pale Ale. And it meant I'll have a Sierra Nevada maybe Pale Sierra. Ale. Yeah. Yeah. And so, with companies like that starting a more craft, a more authentic, uh, uh, I don't know if they are all natural or organic mm -hmm. or never tested on animals or whatever. <laughs> so many drunk cows. This beer was never tested on, on marmots. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, there's this whole whole food movement yeah, and farm sure. table and all this, you know, very West Coasty feeling, natural, yummy, authentic, whatever yeah. words you want to use to describe this wave of, of, of food and beverage. Is that, is that sort of what opened up the opportunity for you or what was it? Yeah, I think we, we just saw the writing on the wall. Like we had that, uh, whatever intuition we, we saw like a little taste of it happening this market shift we saw it with like stumptown coffee roasters out of portland where ryan had been living in portland after ben prior back to the bay area we saw it with um the one shop in california and that was in san francisco that was teeing up this new wave and we were at that point ryan had been working in coffee i had gotten jumped into coffee after college um after i did computer work for like five years um 
with my major. So I went straight to using my major. So, um, and uh, <laughs> so degree was good. Almost degree was good. But uh, yeah, and we just. Thanks, mom and dad. Yeah, thanks, mom and dad. And uh, yeah, immediately just saw that there was this thing happening and that we wanted to be part of it. And we could feel the tipping. We could feel it tipping. And so I. And, and when you say this thing, how would you describe this thing that you wanted to be a part of? How would you describe it? Man, it is tough to describe. It's easy to describe uh, first and second wave. Well, I guess um, the biggest thing about it is, oh, man. Yeah, there was just a movement. There were like, a, there was a group of people. I don't know. There had to be less than a couple hundred people who all kind of knew about it. But it was more about, um, you know, the interest in a particular lot of coffee, where it was grown, what variety it is roasting it in a way that you can actually taste the, the yeah lighter the roasting characteristics. The coffee was roasted a lot lighter than, than previous uh, iterations. Latte art, barista culture. Yeah, I don't know. Well, what, what's barista culture? Well, Colby mentioned latte art. You know, that was something that not everybody knew how to do. I mean, nowadays, you, it, it's essentially an expectation. Not maybe not with the corporate coffee bars, but if you go into an independent coffee shop and they're not pouring latte art, they should be. And, and you guys <laughs> have uh, gotten a lot of notoriety for latte art, have you not? Early on, when it was more, it was you know, it was more interesting to cover. Maybe you know, nine years ago. Yeah, training and, so and all is that. Latte art passe now? <laughs> no, no, it's still it's still good. It still counts. It, it, it's just um, we have, in fact, we have a latte art <laughs> contest, right? Come yeah, on. we have a latte art competition that we'll throw it, in a couple of weeks at our at our headquarters. It's just something that baristas awesome. can yeah. like. It's it's part. It's just part of the, their culture. The you know it's and uh, it's again. It's not like the most important part of your coffee drink, but it, to me, it's just it's a symbol of quality that you, people are taking the time, or that they're trained enough, or that they're steaming their milk well enough to accomplish that. And so, yes, you could have great latte art and totally shitty espresso and you could have great latte art and totally bad service or a filthy cafe. There's so many things that could go wrong. It's not the end all, but it's just, it's, it's, it's a visual cue yeah. that you may, that you might be in the right place. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's certainly what it says to me as a customer is, wow, if they're this good at that shit, mm -hmm. then this copy must be fucking awesome. <laughs> that would be the hope. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's the dot you want us to connect. Yeah. And it just True. sort of draws a line between like Ryan said, if you, you walked into a place and they just hand you your cappuccino, it's just a mound of foam, or you know, you might, you know, it it's sort of like saying that that you know, like they're they're taking it to a certain level, yeah. but um, not beyond that. So we had in one of the early uh, Legends and Losers, we had Anne Miracua on. And she's Forbes called her the quote unquote most powerful woman in startups. Wow. And yeah, she's a freaking genius. And one of the things that Ann says is that entrepreneurs have an aha. They have yeah. some kind of an insight that kind of grabs them and sort of has you by the throat and sort of pulls you into the opportunity. And I, I hear you talking about it, but maybe take me back to what, what was that, you know, what Ann would call market insight that grabbed you? Um, for me, cause Ryan had, had been in coffee and so I was newer and my aha moment was really, a lot of it came from just my, my big aha moment in coffee was just tasting coffee that tasted different than anything else I had ever tasted. It tasted amazing. And it was these flavors I didn't know could come from coffee. In the end, it was a really nice Ethiopian coffee that was roasted lighter, but it was what we call acidity, like perceived acidity. It was this like fruity floral component. It was beautiful. And I had never really tasted that before. Um, and that to me was this big aha moment that like coffee could be something else. And then looking into where that coffee comes from and how people, what was behind that was, was kind of like this tipping point that there was this new culture developing and at that time, it was kind of like Ryan said, it was not that many people. It was kind of this cult sensation of people that knew what coffee could be like. And the culture that surrounded it was, 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 was about 
building beautiful cafes, having awesome branding, like fight, you know, like traveling the world to go like find the coffees yourself, roasting them in a way that highlights the coffee and not just dark roasting it. So, you know, um, to hide, you know, defects and like poor quality coffee. And I was like, fuck yeah, I want to be part of this. And it seems like to me, because of course I got to know you guys first as a customer, just walking into her. And, you know, the first one, the first location before you had any others, just looked like this awesome artisan coffee shop. And I remember a lot of people around Santa Cruz at the time saying like, this place is way too nice for Santa Cruz. Like, yeah. this should be in New York or, you know, some somewhere somewhere more uh, ding dong or she she. Mm -hmm. And so you open this one location and this may sound like a funny word, but it's beautiful. And my thought was, well, this is awesome. I hope these guys do well, but it didn't necessarily look like a business that would scale Ooh. because it, it looked like most artisan businesses require the artiste. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my question for you guys is with this third way of this beautiful artisan coffee, how did you then build a business that scales? Cause you guys aren't actually in the stores making lattes. Ooh. Good how, question. How do we do that? Is, right? is it scaling? Um, well, thank you by the way. Okay. You're, you're welcome, man. Beautiful. I'm, just, I'm just telling the truth. He and I built that store, like, and Amy and Amy's dad. And yeah, we had no contractor. <laughs> we actually marks. literally built it. You literally built it. Not the, yeah. not the iteration that you see now, but yeah. the, uh, the original, the original build out. No, yeah. The original was a breakthrough. And, yeah. and you know, the update is, 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 yeah, is this original store in Pleasure Point 10 years old? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll be in uh, November. Yeah. 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 But yeah, we, when we, you're right. I mean, when we first opened it, we took a beat down from people. They were like, people would open the door and be like, what the fuck are you guys doing in here? Especially as we were, like, as we were building it. Yeah. Like you have, you guys like should stop right now. This doesn't belong here. Some, uh, some heavy, down. some heavy East side hate. It was just like one person after the next we're all in their eyes. Like, what are you guys even doing here? Because it was too nice. Yeah, it was nice. It was too different. It was too different. Too different. Yeah. And we, the, it, the thing was we, we weren't trying to be fancy. We weren't trying to be like, you know what? Let's go open this like bougie place on Pleasure Point. We like, you know, we ended up on Pleasure Point because, you know, Ryan found the spot coming down surfing. And, so, you know, and we just wanted to build something that we felt like was awesome. So we built it literally ripping out of pages of his multi-year, I don't know how, five-year-old subscription to dwell dwell magazine we were just like ripping out pages and being like all right we're gonna build this like this we'll build like that walnut <laughs> and and we just wanted a place that felt awesome and you know kind of felt more residential than commercial which is i think what caught people off guard you know a lot for sure but yeah in the end you know it was different and that ended up being a you know a good thing for us because it helped us stand out and, and yeah and the scale how did you have the courage of your convictions i mean what Verb was then and still is today, it, it is very, and I gotta use this word on purpose, different. Mm -hmm. I think that came out of, um, that came out of, I think maybe the, the way that he and I work together, which is we fight over everything and then, <laughs> I don't know, right? Argue about what's best for, for the brand. Yeah. But I think in the end we were we were we didn't want to come across as you know ripping anybody else off because that's not our intention, but we did want to have you know differentiated look and feel to the to the store, and the brand. So, what was your question? <laughs> well, I was gonna say also opening in Pleasure Point, we almost opened in San Francisco. We had we had like leases Which lined up. We almost opened yeah. in Berkeley we, across from Pyramid Brewing. We like we were right there, and then we just said. Well, actually, Ryan said, you know, I'm out. I'm moving. I'm moving to the Santa Cruz. I'm going to, you know, I have my, my lady. We're probably going to get married at some point. And all we do is like want to go down to Santa Cruz, surf, ride mountain bikes. I'm moving there. And so when we opened up Verve in Santa Cruz, because I ended up jumping ahead, you know, we, we, I ended up coming down and we just said, fuck it, let's do it. But uh, 
but that was different too. Like just going to like what seemed like an un, not the obvious market to go yeah. build this company. It, right. it definitely kicked off like the differentiation yeah. element was that it, we weren't in a like the you know hip neighborhood in San Francisco it, or Portland it, or New York. Well, the other thing too is at your yeah. price point, we should talk about pricing strategy, but at your price point in a sleepy beach town where you know people absolutely uh, work to live not the other way around and we like to pick up a cheap slice of pizza and mm -hmm. yeah just kind of keep moving a lot of you know there's a bifurcation in santa cruz of course uh, you guys well know but you know there's a lot of construction workers and, and people who have sort of architected their life with surfing at the center and mm -hmm. whatever sustenance <laughs> out there right yeah. so the, I remember it so well when you guys were getting ready to open, like who the fuck's going to buy, like what's the average uh, drink transaction at a verb? Drink transaction or ticket transaction? A drink I, transaction. Um, I mean, our drinks range anywhere from between probably, at the time, it was probably between two, two fifty and like five bucks. And so how much more expensive would that have been than the, uh, the, the Jolly Green Giant. <laughs> uh, depending on the drink, anywhere from you know a quarter to a dollar, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean we were yeah. maybe even up. Yeah, like could have been like fifty cent, fifty percent more expensive. Yeah. So how did you have the courage to stay with your vision, particularly in a sleepy beach town, as opposed to in downtown San Francisco or Santa Monica or Soho or some other ding dong place where, for would seem more natural well it's we had a guy um share a term with us secret there are seekers of truth and seekers of wealth in the world secrets of what seekers of truth and truth. seekers of wealth and he coined us seekers of truth we seek truth so in this instance i think it was more about you know, all of this is built into part of the brand, which is, you know, the co it's not like we're just putting a price tag on coffee. Like, ooh, what do you think people would buy our coffee for? It's more like we found this crazy coffee in Honduras that's like fucking insane. It's expensive. In order to sell it, we have to sell it for $4 a cup. So we're going to sell it for $4 a cup. Or seven. Or leave. Or, seven. or go do other shit <laughs> with our time. Yeah. So it's more, it was more it came out of, yeah. And just sort of the fact that we wanted it also meant that we thought other people would want it. Um, we didn't know, but we felt like there was this movement happening. So we felt like that people were going to want, we were early kind of, but we felt like people were going to want, people want great things. And, and the cool thing about a cup of coffee is like, you know, a shitty cup of coffee is a buck or two and an amazing cup of coffee is like five to seven. That's like, you know, you're not talking like a glass, a bottle of wine where like, a, you know, a shitty bottle of wine is like two bucks and then, you know, you can pay crazy amounts of money for wine, but like you can get to the top of the pyramid apex out on coffee at like 10, seven, bucks, seven yeah. 10 bucks a, a yeah. cup. And which is like kind of crazy in this mindset of fucking $10 or $7 for a cup of coffee. That's crazy. But actually in the scheme of things, how much it's going to ruin your life or like, it, you know, your budget for the week. <laughs> it's probably not going to take you down. Yeah. I don't get drunk when I drink coffee. <laughs> you have to drink more of it. Yeah, you haven't had enough. Man. <laughs> you have you know, to keep it's interesting going. because is there a name for this third wave of coffee, guys? Third, Just third wave, wave. wave. Just the third wave. Yeah. So you're intuitive category designers mm -hmm. in that you saw the shift happening and you actually wanted to be part of designing or defining that shift. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah that's fair. Cause we did recognize that we were coming in early and you know, cause we were talking about opening and feeling the sense of urgency and then talking about like, well, maybe what if we waited a year, but I remember having this discussion with Ryan, it was like, we can't wait a year in a year from now, there's gonna be like, you know, a hundred more, but like right now we can go, it's like, it's, it's go time. So you could feel the market. You could oh, yeah. feel there was a shift in the category that was opening up this yeah. high-end, artisan, however you want to, you know, great experience, unique physical location. Yeah. We, we didn't know what it was actually going to become to the point where 
you know, we didn't know what it was going to become, which is like much greater than the, the market and also our, what happened to our company. You know, we didn't know that what that was going to happen, how much it was going to scale, how much it was going to grow, what yeah. that, it, that Starbucks was going to make, was going to start making shifts to like answer what was, what we're doing, not necessarily Verve, but Verve and other, I mean, but including Verve, ways, yeah. but in some ways, yeah. what we're all doing, um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, because you, you changed the game. Yeah. And it's interesting, as Starbucks got more and more McDonald's-like and less and less authentic feeling, the original sort of insight, it, in a lot of ways, did open up an opportunity, right? That was essentially the, their shift this way was the third wave shift the other way. It's yeah. interesting, you know, if I think about the beer market and I go back... I don't know, about 30 years, <clears throat> there was this movement called um, microbrews. That's mm -hmm. what they called it. Yeah, at I the remember time. that. Yeah. Samuel yeah. Adams, Sierra Nevada, Red Hook. Red Hook and Pete's Brewing. Yeah, mm -hmm. Pete's, yeah. I remember. Uh, oh, Pete's Wicked Ale. Pete's, Pete's yeah, Wicked Ale, right? Pitching yeah, yeah. back to Ray's Liquor. <laughs> Were you getting Pete's Wicked Ale at Ray's Liquor? Mm. Well, eventually, but it's definitely started off with much low brown coffee. Yeah, exactly. 40s and Natty Light. I'll never forget back in the late 90s, uh, getting on a plane to go on a business trip and then sit, sit down next to this guy and I fire up my laptop and I'm working on a presentation for some speech I have to give. Yeah, and I can sort of, you know, you know it's like when you can feel somebody watching you do your shit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I can sort of feel this guy watching me in the seat next to me. And eventually he says, hey, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but like, what do you do? This looks like a pretty cool presentation so i tell him i was i was uh, at a high growth internet company at the time and uh, so we had a whole conversation about that and i said to him so you know what do you do he says oh i work at pete's brewing i said oh man i love you guys what do you do there and he says i'm pete oh shit Whoa. no way yeah he's a fantastic guy uh, and a, a very clever entrepreneur has gone on to do some other cool things and very, wow. uh, very, very humble guy. Wow. So, you know, anyway, to go back, you think about that and sort of how big Budweiser and Coors mm -hmm. and these guys got almost created an opportunity. And then interestingly enough, Sam's kind of becomes the category king, Sierra Nevada, of course, Pete's, yeah. uh, Corona was getting big and all that. Um, and then those guys sort of become the new monsters, right? Mm -hmm. Sam Adams is not exactly a microbrew. Yeah, yeah. And so they sort of become who they attack. Right. Yep. Is that what's going on in coffee? That, that yeah. Starbucks is Sam Adams and there's, I hate to say this, but not a lot of difference between Budweiser and Sam Adams anymore. Is that sort of analogous? I don't, I don't know that we're quite that far along in the curve. But trajectory-wise. But certainly it's on that path. I mean, yeah. we, I think having watched, you know, going through like late high school and college uh, during the time that the, the beer thing happened definitely gave us some insight as to how this type of thing unfolds. Yeah. But it's not, it hasn't, you know, we're not that far along to be able to see what you just described. I mean, we definitely would like Starbucks. You can, I mean, that definitely has happened. But with some of our peers that we, a couple that were out there that we looked up to and a couple that were out there that shifted their marketing to become what the new category was, you, it's happening around us right now. I mean, not, not to like jump ahead or not that we're on a, a, like a, a line here, but. You There's know, no <laughs> jump. We could chase any rabbit down any zebra hole you want. <laughs> well, the shit's crazy right now in coffee. I mean, like uh, we have peers, you know, out there that Stumptown, Intelligentsia, um, you know, some of these people that were old, do you know, been around since 2000 or 95 that yeah. were kind of like a couple of the category kings in third wave coffee, if you will. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, acquisitions and consolidations happening right now in our in our niche. I mean, the, you know, you know, JAB have they're like a German family. They owned like Jimmy Choo Shoes and things like that. Billionaire family. Um, 
they just started acquiring coffee companies, maybe like, mm, I didn't read up on this before I came here, but like, you know, I don't know, in the past couple of years, they just came out of nowhere and they bought Pete's, they bought Pete's, they bought Green Mountain Coffee and K-Cup. Um, they bought, I believe, Dunkin' Donuts. They bought huge, um, a company called like Grindmaster out of the East Coast. They're paying like, you know, billions for some of these. They paid like 14 billion for Green Mountain. They bought Stumptown. They bought Intelligentsia. Um, they bought a company in Norway. They're, they're acquiring so many brands that were the ones out there that, you know, that were like just right, just like right ahead of us, a step ahead of us that now we're looking around and thinking like, Mm, what the like fuck? Yeah. You like, so you like you a slaughtering house. We're hearing Yeah. Clearly wants to be the category king and is yeah. buying all these brands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? How do you compete? Well, that's a great question. I mean, the way we've always competed is just, I think Ryan had this, you know, like he, Ryan talked about his like football coach, like when, you know, like when someone else would fuck up and you'd go to like, I'm telling your story. Yeah, go for it. I'll see if I can remember it. Break it down. Yeah, when someone else would fuck up and you'd be like, you'd complain about it, the coach would come grab you and rally you and say, hey, listen, you worry about you. And that's sort of been, whether it's the right move or not, that's been sort of Ryan and my's like mantra to each other is just like, fuck everyone else. We do our thing. That's why we opened in Santa Cruz and not somewhere more obvious and why we've always tried to like pave our own way um, because it's more fun and also we think it's what we're supposed to be doing not to be oblivious or unaware like i'm telling you what's happening in this industry but it's crazy i mean I, we look at it we think about you can think about how to counterpoint on it but also we have to play like our strongest game every day so we're, that's kind of what we're we're our response to it is just trying to be make sure we're playing at 100 yeah well, and, and you continue yeah. to grow yeah. uh, aggressively, but at least as I can tell in a controlled way. Mm -hmm. So how do you think, how many locations are, is where at now? We're currently at nine in four cities, uh, Los Angeles. We have three in Los Angeles, four in Santa Cruz, um, one currently in San Francisco and one in Tokyo and more on the horizon uh, of yeah. course tokyo would be the natural <laughs> yeah we're just right. trying to like obvious, ease, obvious ease out into this thing because you've got the west coast locked up so you just keep <laughs> going west yeah. until yeah. you're going east that's, <laughs> what, that's what we joke about yeah well so hey, just because we're talking about it why why the fuck tokyo guys i know crazy right yeah well we had um we had some folks that were man it's kind of a trippy story but there was a uh, um there's a space available in, in Tokyo and some of the folks. I hate to interrupt you, Ryan, but how do you even find out there's a space that would be perfect available in Tokyo? Well, I didn't actually. The folks who were, who were leasing and curating this new real estate um, in Shinjuku were on. Actually, Where is Shinjuku? Excuse my ignorance. Uh, no worries. It's a neighborhood in Tokyo and Shinjuku Station is the train station that services the, the business center there. It's kind of an like uh, it's a cool like street street neighborhood. It's it's um, a little rough historically. It's where like all you can go there and find like you know basically like the Japanese mafia and strip clubs and all that kind of all that kind of like get into all the neon twenty four seven very easily. Yeah, yeah, never shuts down. But it's it's transitioning. We'll bring you if that happens. Yeah, it's so transitioning. You were carrying. It's it's we, we it's like strippers awesome. and fighting. <laughs> Should you get your place? <laughs> Um, but, but then, so is it gentrifying and you identified it as like a, a cool hit place to be? Well, the folks who were, who were curating the, the retail went on a coffee crawl, West coast coffee crawl. I don't know if it was coffee crawl, but on a, on a West coast scouting mission to find a coffee brand, because it's sort of, I mean, if you're at all tuned into this third wave scene, it definitely birthed on the West, on the West coast. Yeah. And it's still, you know, largely, you know, this is where you would come. This would be the, this would be the epicenter for it. So these people, West Coast resting. yeah. And, and you guys are uh, overly immodest, but you've had a lot to do with designing and defining the West Coast third wave coffee category. There's sure. a lot of people who would compare the category to Verb, or, or said in a different way that you guys are emblematic of what this third wave of coffee represents. Is that's fair, right? 
Sure. I mean, even your own modest ass mm -hmm. would say that, right? <laughs> well, we have always said that part of it. We yeah. always wanted to be on the stay on the short list. So uh, I think we've been pretty successful at that. And we were definitely early to the game. And the people that were earlier than us are now all acquired, almost all acquired, uh, Blue Bottles um, doing their own thing. But um, on the West Coast. So, yeah. We've, I, we've been, acquired. We've, yeah, we've been, we've been part of the game for sure. But to get back to your story, so these Japanese developers yeah. came to the West Coast specifically to identify particular brands that they wanted that would be differentiated and unique and so forth. Yeah, Correct. to curate, yeah. To they curate wanted their like space. This, they wanted this California identifiable West like, Coast, roaster. yeah, West Coast coffee brand. So when we first encountered them, they'd already been to every location of ours, um, L.A., San Francisco. Well, I guess not San Francisco at the time. L.A. and Santa Cruz, and they had a they had a binder like dude two inches thick, photographs like reviews the whole thing about our brand about each location they had this binder. They had binders for every location. So they had they had was already it, was it like Mitt, Mitt Romney when he had binders of women? Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> it's just they like had it's binders similar. of verb. <laughs> Very similar. Very similar. Yeah, so they had they they seeked us out is is the long um, answer. And, and then they secret shopped us, like Ryan said, when they you know they showed up with these binders, they secret shopped us, but they secret shopped all of our all of our peers as well. So it wasn't like they had their eyes necessarily just set on Verve. They came to the West Coast to find the best coffee brand they could bring to Japan that had West Coast vibes and highest quality service product atmosphere. Secret shopped us among all of our peers, including those that got acquired. They'd actually been doing it for like a year, they said. Yeah. Like multiple trips. Um, and uh, they called us and, you know, said, what, were you willing to have a meeting with us? We didn't even actually quite understand why until they met. We met with them and they unveiled all <laughs> what they'd been up to. And uh, Wow. Yeah, yeah, we went out there and checked out the space and the team was, you know, they were really, really cool. Uh, the space was great. It's in the busiest train station in the world, which is like, millions of people every day go through this train station and um we're not like in the train station Anybody we're just like ever been at, on a at it. subway in uh tokyo knows what, what busy subways look like right yeah and this is the busiest in the world and we're, we're not inside it but we're you know adjacent Near, to it yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's pretty cool and uh, how hard was it to do business in Japan, to hire people? Obviously, you have a general manager there, yeah. to train people. Uh, you know, unpack that one a little bit for me. Well, besides the language barrier, um, because contrary to popular belief, not everyone in the world just speaks English also. <laughs> um, but uh, they really make it inconvenient for us. <laughs> I always right? love in the tech industry. When people would be talking about markets, particularly early stage startups, they'd say, well, yeah, there's the U.S. and then there's, and, and I'll never forget the first time I heard this expression, rest of world. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, yeah, R-O-W. Right? Uh, yeah, no, they, um, R-O-W. Rest of world. Yeah. And the, it's been amazing, actually, because the, I mean, you spent time in Japan? Yeah, a lot of time in Japan. Yeah, it's. It's, it's amazing. And so, you know, we, we were through our, through our um, partner there able to attract some, and with our brand, uh, able to attract some really great people. Um, they, everyone that we hired initially came to Santa Cruz. Uh, they went through the full Santa Cruz training and then we- you teach them to surf? Uh, they, 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 they embrace surf, it all. Yeah, yeah. They're like, we have like B-boys on the team. There's this like, they're the coolest hip, hip kids, but they're all- you know, really verve. So they're really positive, really outgoing. Um, and they embrace the training. Like, you know, it's one of our best run stores. I mean, is it's, it really? Yeah, sure. absolutely. It's immaculate. Uh, it's really well designed. They it's, it's merchandised. Well, um, the coffee is made all the, I mean, like it's perfect tens on how they make coffee as far as how I would want them to. I'm not, you know, I'm just saying I go there and get coffee. I'm like, Fuck yeah, this is what I'm talking so, about. So the two of you go to bed at night knowing that it's somebody's a, making some awesome fucking lattes. It's on point. Yeah. Shinjuku's on point. And in fact, I was, when I was just there for our one-year anniversary, we have all of our original staff except for one person. Wow. And that person left to go help his buddy start 
a coffee shop who they want to carry Verve. That's so, right. Um, and that's it. The end of part one. Now, please turn the tape over, press play, and strap yourself in for part two. <laughs>